Many years ago, a university professor asked his students to respond to one word with one thought that came to the mind when they heard the one word. And he wrote on the board the word Christmas. And then he said, write down what flashes into your mind on a piece of paper. And then he gathered all the pieces of paper together. And he went through them and he noticed all these answers. Holiday, Turkey, Santa Claus, mistletoe, presents, carols. But no one had written the birth of Jesus Christ. And that's so tragic that so many come to the Christmas season and enjoy all these other things associated with it, but miss the central message of Christmas, which is the birth of Jesus Christ. In fact, the word Christmas has Christ in it, doesn't it? To remind us it's all about him and what he has done. Now, the Gospel for Asia organization have produced a little video to remind us of the need to have Christ in Christmas. We're just, we're just going to watch it first before we turn to this passage of Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. That's a good reminder, isn't it? That Christmas is not about ourselves. It's about helping others and sharing the gift of Jesus Christ. And one of the things that is always a blessing at Christmas time is singing the wonderful Christmas carols, isn't it? The first Christmas carol was not sung in a church. It was sung on the hillside of Bethlehem by the angels. We read it in this passage where they sung to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Charles Wesley, we listened to his great carol this morning in the first service, was so moved by this story of these angels singing that he wrote his famous, most famous Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And this legacy of carols, and joy and happiness around Christmas has carried on down the centuries amongst the people of God throughout the world. And Today, as we gather, there are millions gathering in similar places, in similar manner to how we gather this morning. Now, the shepherds that heard this message, we dealt with in some detail in the first service. But let me sum them up this way. These shepherds were the social outcasts of Jewish society. They were regarded as unclean, vulgar. They were regarded as thieves. They were regarded as the lowest of the low in Jewish society. Just to illustrate, if a case came to court, a shepherd was not allowed to be a witness in court because he was regarded as too untrustworthy. Most of the year, they were not allowed even into the temple to participate in the worship because they were regarded as ceremonially unclean to be part of Jewish society. So they lived in their own groups, these shepherds, on the wilds of Bethlehem, in the hills. Unknown, unwelcome, uncared for. Many of them did get involved in all kinds of sin. They would steal from one another. They would steal from those in the towns and villages. And when the child grew up, the parent hoped, please may my son or my daughter not become a shepherd. Of all the jobs that people aspired not to have, uh, at top of that list would have been a shepherd. And yet when Jesus was born, the first people, the first group of people to hear about his birth, the message sent by the angels was to those people that were the unwelcome ones the unknowable ones, the ones that nobody cared about. Jesus, his entrance into this world was the most momentous moment in world history. 
it has changed the history of this world forever. We divide our calendar by his birth. History is split before Christ and after Christ. He is the most unique person. He is the most famous person in all of human history. And God sent this great host of angels to announce his coming and his birth. And they sang with this great host on the hills of Bethlehem. Now, it says in this passage, there was a multitude of them. Now, we know there are millions upon millions of angels. And this expression, a multitude, means that it couldn't be counted with the human eye. Maybe there were hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of angels filled the skies that night and began to sing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now, what does the carol, the first Christmas carol, teach us about Christmas? Well, it teaches us first that God is the great object of worship. Notice how it begins. Glory to God in the highest. Why did the angels begin by saying glory to God? Because the Christmas story, the Christmas message, the meaning of Christmas came from the heart of God. It was God's plan. It was God's idea. In fact, the history of this universe is God's history. If you read Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning, God. It doesn't begin with man. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In fact, if you read all of Genesis chapter 1, man doesn't even appear in the chapter until the sixth day. And then he only appears as the passive recipient of God's creative power. Nothing else. That's all he is. Man is not significant in God's creative power in God's creative moment. He's just a creature. We tend to be so full of self-importance and man's importance in our society. And the Christmas story is a reminder that it's all about God. It's all about his glory. It's all about his plan. It's all about his way. And the angels had their theology straight here because they say glory to God. This great plan of salvation, redemption. It's God's way, God's plan, and history is God's history. And you know, nothing has changed today. The history you and I are living is one that God has already planned. God has already purposed. We are living in the 21st century. We are living in a period of great turbulence in world history, aren't we? And it seems that events are all out of control. It seems that everything's running away with itself and there's chaos and confusion. 2020 has reminded us that man really has lots of plans but no way to affect his plans. Isn't that right? This time last year when we sat in Christmas services, nobody imagined that 12 months later we would be sitting in such circumstances. Nobody imagined that for most of 2020 the world has been under this great pandemic. The world has been full of anxiety and fear and suffering and death and economic hardship. But God knew. God knew what was going to happen and he knows what's going to happen in 2021 because history is God's history. It's not our history. Someone put it this way. History is a word that should be split in two. His story. It's God's story. The Bible tells us that God began history, but it also tells us God will end history. It tells us that when God decides that the world will come to an end, it'll come to an end. No, one, no, no other, no sooner, no later, exactly when God plans it. Now let me make it very personal. You are here today because God planned it. You are born the year you were born in because God planned it to happen. You were brought up in the place that you were brought up in, in the family you were brought up in, in the home you were brought in because God planned it. 
It's his story of your life. You had nothing to do with it. You were just the one born. And now you're here today to hear the same message that these shepherds heard. That God is in control. That God is working out his plan through human history. Through your personal history. And you need to take note of it. But then, not only do these angels speak of God as the great object of worship. But in this first Christmas carol, they speak of a great subject to worship. Notice what they said. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. But before they said that, they said in verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. What was the great subject, topic of their worship? The coming of the Savior into the world. Now, the word Savior literally means this, one who saves, one who delivers. Jesus Christ came into this world not to be simply a good example, although he was the greatest example. But if he came just simply to be a good example, that would be very little use to us because we can't follow his example. We don't have the ability. We're sinners. He didn't just come into this world to be a great teacher, although he was a great teacher. But we can't follow his teachings because of our sinful nature. That's the problem. We need more than a teacher. We need more than a great example. What we need fundamentally is a savior. Someone to deal with the problem of our sin. And the great news, the good news of the story of Christmas is that God gave us the greatest gift, a savior, the savior of the world. And he didn't appear just to the rich and the powerful, like the wise men who were rich and powerful from the east. He appeared first to the shepherds, to the lowest of the low, to let everybody know that Jesus Christ is not just the savior of the rich and the powerful and the educated. He's the savior of the lowly shepherds. And the message was given first to them to emphasize that he's accessible to all. That he's available to all. That he's the savior of all. And all who come to him can receive the gift of salvation through him. The gift of forgiveness through him. Now this Christmas season, I hope you receive many gifts from your friends, your family, maybe you've received some even from this church, from your work colleagues, from your employers. And those are all wonderful things. But the greatest gift to receive this Christmas is not a financial gift, it's not a material gift, it's not a food gift. The greatest gift is to receive God's greatest gift, the gift of a Savior that these shepherds received that day in Bethlehem. And you know, Christmas, the message of Christmas is not let us come to shop. Hello, all the retailers are going crazy right now, aren't they? It's not let us eat. Hello, all the restaurants are hoping that you come and eat and fill yourself with their food. No, the great message of Christmas is let us come and worship him the Savior of the world. And I hope this morning that you have come to this service with this object. I have come to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. That's the message of Christmas. And these angels, they sung of, they had the right object, glory to God. They had the right subject, the Lord Jesus Christ. But then they had the right reason to worship. What was the right reason? They understood that the reason we must worship 
the Lord Jesus Christ, is because he is our Savior. He's the Savior of all. Notice what they said in verse 11 to these shepherds. And pause at every word. For, this is the reason, unto, what's the next word? You. You. Jesus Christ is not just a Savior of some people. A group of people far away from you. These shepherds, they could have understood if he said, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is the Savior of the scribes and the Pharisees, the educated, the religious people. But what was so surprising to them, what made their hearts so joyful, was that the angels said to them, the shepherds, the, the outcasts, the lowest of the low, and to you, you personally, is born this day, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And they were told that this Savior brings peace, goodwill toward men. Now, why do we need peace? Well, I hardly need to explain it, do I? We live in a world that has no peace. We live in a world where there's trade wars, where there's physical wars, where there's threats of wars. We live in a world where there's uh, home wars, kitchen wars, where husbands and wives are at strife one with the other, when siblings are at war one with the other, when employees are at war with one another. We live in a world where there is no harmony. There is no peace. There is no joy. Why is there no peace? Because man has no peace with God. Because of sin, there has become a break in the relationship between God and man. And then because man has no peace with God, he has no peace in his heart, no peace within. And because he has no peace within, he then has no peace with his fellow man. He can't get along. And the Bible says that in order to fix this problem, we have to repair the relationship between God and ourselves. Once we have peace with God, then we have peace in our hearts. Once we have peace in our hearts, then we can have peace with our fellow man. That's, that's the way we have to do it. Of course, the world tries to do it the other way around. They try to bring world peace between man and man, but it never works, does it? it ends up squabbling. It ends up fighting. It ends up with rivalries and jealousies and anger and threats and physical attacks because man cannot establish peace with his fellow man until he first finds peace with God and Jesus Christ came into the world to bring peace to the hearts of men and women to bring peace between God and ourselves and if we solve that then we can solve the other problem of peace with our fellow man and the angels recognized that day on the hills of Bethlehem that the war is over between God and man. That Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace, the one who will bring peace to the hearts of men and women. And they sung in their millions with great joy in their hearts. Now let me finish this off. How did the shepherds respond? with this good news. They could have stayed on the hills, couldn't they? And said, yeah, we know all about this stuff from the Old Testament, from the Bible, that there's a Messiah coming, that he's going to bring peace. In theoretically, we acknowledge that's true. We learned that in Sunday school. We learned that in the synagogue. But you know, these shepherds didn't do that. These shepherds showed they really understood the message. They showed that they wanted and needed the Savior. Because notice what it says, verse 15, it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem. 
see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. What thing had come to pass? The Savior had come. The one who can take away your sins had come. The one who can make you anew, give you everlasting life, give you peace in your heart, forgive you your sins. He has come. And these shepherds rose up and they left their sheep on the hills of Bethlehem and they rushed. In fact, it says in verse 16, they came with haste. These men knew they were sinners. They knew they needed a savior. They knew they needed peace with God. And they made it a priority to get to the manger because they needed the Savior. And when they got there, they came and worshipped him, just like the wise men. What were they doing when they worshipped? They were saying, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. And they bowed down before him and they were saying, forgive me my sins. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb, and I shall be whiter than the snow. Did they find forgiveness? Verse 20 tells us the answer. It says, the shepherds returned back to the hills of Bethlehem. What were they doing? Glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. They had heard God's word. They had seen God's Savior. And they believed that he was their Savior. And they went home, or in their case, the hills were their home. They went back to the hills. And they had the second Christmas carol service in the history of this world. The first one was the angels. And now the second Christmas carol service was in the same place, but this time it was the shepherds praising God and singing glory to God in the highest and goodwill toward all men. They not only said it, but were told they returned. They told all about it, those around thee. Now, let me wrap this up by saying there's a lesson here for you and I. If you want to go to heaven, you have to be like the little shepherd. You have to come to the Savior. You have to humble yourself and make your way to God's gift at Bethlehem and receive the gift of salvation through him. You can be a shepherd. You could be a wise man today, but only if you bow down before the Savior and receive the gift of salvation. Use these shepherds this Christmas season as your model for how you must respond to the Christmas message. He came for you. Go back to the verse. With this we close. Verse 11 of Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. If you don't remember anything else from what I say today, remember this verse. And make it very personal. Put your name in there. For unto me, put your name in, is born this day a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. 2,000 years ago, God sent you a gift. It wasn't wrapped in tinsel, fancy paper but it was wrapped in swaddling clothes that's cloths lots and lots of cloths wrapped around a baby laid in a manger and God said that's my gift to deal with your sin but you know in order to receive a Christmas gift you have to do one thing don't you you have to reach out and take it receive it and you will never understand Christmas truly understand Christmas until you reach out by faith and accept the gift of Jesus Christ accept the gift of salvation found in him and him alone and you'll never truly enjoy Christmas until you look in the father's face and you say thank you for the gift 
I receive it by faith in Christ alone. It's good to give gifts at Christmas. But the tradition of giving gifts didn't begin with man. It began with God. But John 3.16 says what? For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave the first gift of Christmas, the Lord Jesus Christ. And giving began in the heart of God, not the heart of man. And it was for you and it's for me. We sing the words every Christmas, joy to the world. The Lord has come. And then in the stanza it says this, let every heart prepare him room. Have you prepared room in your heart for Jesus Christ? Have you opened your heart to him and said, I need the gift of salvation. I need the gift of a savior. I'm as lost as those shepherds. And until you do that, your heart will be heavy and you will have no peace. No joy in your soul. 2020 has been a very difficult year for so many people. But the good news is this. Better days are coming because of the Christmas gift. The Savior of the world has come. And he's coming back again. Because of all these things, I can look you in the eye this Christmas, and say, have a very blessed Christmas and have a very happy new year. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for the good news of Christmas that the Savior of the world has come. and He has given us the gift of salvation, eternal life, peace and joy. And the other great news is he's coming back again to receive us unto himself. And he says that where I am, there ye may be also. The gift of Christmas keeps on giving and giving and giving. Bless each one here. You know their hearts. You know their circumstances. We pray, Father, that you would minister to them through thy word this morning. For we ask all these things. In Jesus' precious name, amen.